You're welcome to First Take on 3FM and TV3. My name is Jifa Bampo. Today we are in conversation with the NDC's running mate for the 2020 elections, Professor Jane Opokwajiman. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on our show, First Take on 3FM and TV3. You're welcome. Thank you very much and uh, thanks for having me. And you know, I've had four men on this program over the last month and a half. I'm glad you are the first woman to be on the show. So Thank thanks. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid people were going to be calling me out and saying I haven't had any women, so oh, good to well. have you. Oh, I hope that's not the only reason. <laughs> no, certainly okay. not. <laughs> so it's been uh, some three months since the hustle and bustle of electoral politics yes. uh, in 2020. Have you been spending your time? Uh, doing many things. Um, doing some writing, attending lots of meetings. But um, you see, I asked myself one question, and that was um, the paucity of women in parliament and in leadership and in politics generally. So, and this is a broad topic. So I decided to zoom in on the women in parliament. So, uh, Prof, you say you've been doing some writing, attending meetings. <laughs> Don't you miss uh, that campaign? Oh, well, you can't have it that all the time. Sure. You know, there's a time for everything. And as I was telling you, uh, one of the things I'm doing now uh, began with a question of why we have so many few women in leadership generally, in parliament, especially in politics, and of course, I'm not the first to ask myself that question. And many people have made many inputs into answering that question. But for me, a gap has been, OK, so we support them to get into parliament. But who helps them to stay in parliament? So what support do they have as they are in parliament? Therefore, I decided to draft a concept around this. And I began with the NDC Women in Parliament to begin with. Mm. And it was quite interesting. The objective really was to create the space for them to bond, to create the space to network, to know where to go for support, just so that they don't feel abandoned and alone once they're able to cross that bridge and get into parliament. And it was very, very interesting. So that's what you've been busy yourself a yes, bit with. Yes, one of the many things. things. Right. So <laughs> coaching for female members of parliament who now belong to Mostly, the NDC. I don't even know whether to call it coaching or mentoring or any of the names. I just wanted them to draw on their own strengths. You know, they may be friends, maybe two or three people are close to each other. But how about the others you don't know? And they also bring a lot of experience, they bring a lot of strengths. So where is the space for them to draw on these strengths? What are the challenges they face as women in parliament? How do they manage all the responsibilities they have? You know, beyond themselves as people, their families, the party, parliament, their community, their constituents, you know, who is helping them to connect all these dots? And I learned a lot during that uh, the campaign. Week. Oh, yes. And I learned a lot also a question, during the uh, workshop. OK. A question I was asked to ask you is, for someone who is a high achiever, academic, author, you know, technocrat in education, and then becoming a politician, what advice, based on the experience you say you've had, you learned a lot, what advice would you give younger women, maybe myself or others, uh, who look at politics, and I'm not sure whether that's an arena to step into. Well, I didn't start life by being a politician. That is uh, loosely defined as in belonging to a party. But you need to recognize that politics is around you all the time. And um, I don't have advice as in a model that you can apply. What I can just say to any young person is that just do what you enjoy doing and do it well. Learn it, practice it, do it well. Ensure it's in yours to others and that in the end it's in yours to you too. So I think these may be some of the building blocks into whatever area you may end up you know, being. If you're in management, you know there's a lot of politics there. 
And, you know, I'm not going to ask you <laughs> <laughs> to share your own experience, but we all know, you know, I'm sure the listeners also know what I'm talking about. And therefore, all the skills of leadership, some of them you may read, some of them you may learn. A lot of it may depend on your own personality. But I think if you have a vision of where you want things to go, where you want to go and how you want to bring others along, it helps, it clarifies things for you. Is it important to have a strong sense of social justice, for instance, so in relation to the Everybody question. must, regardless where Some you are. Some people don't. Well, but I think it helps. And it will help all of us. Fairness is important. It, you know, if you don't have fairness, you don't have justice, you can't be good, you can't be true to yourself first, you can't be true to others. Um, but I'm not sure the kind of leader uh, or the kind of the type, rather, of leader you will be if you are ever placed in any position of responsibility. You must care for others. Because if you're a leader, others under you are not leaders. How are you exercising that leadership to ensure that others are empowered? That's very important. And, you talked and about I think it goes for everyone in any profession, at any level, you know, in any situation. You talked about caring for others. That's something we women do all the time. <laughs> Some even joke that we care for others more than we care for ourselves. Um, one of the things in talking to you I would like to ask, um, what are the prospects for us as Ghanaian women, you know, in our opportunities now uh, as we are in our country? All the opportunities are at our disposal. And it's up to us to make use of them. It is not a question of somebody going to say, hey, Ghanaian women, come along, this, this is what I have for you. Who is that person? Sometimes you need to create the opportunity for yourself and for others. I mean, let's take education. We've had education in this country for a very long time. Ghanaian women generally have been well educated. Yes, we know we have high illiteracy rates. We know if you look at the figures, the women are always in the majority. What are we doing about that? Is it enough that we say they are in the majority? Obviously not, because then we know that they lack certain things. What are we doing about that? Okay. What would you, in talking about what are we doing about that, what would you want women to do? Because the truth is many women are less economically endowed um, women tend to face challenges in being able to advance themselves. Um, of course. You and know, I would like you to use the experience of your, your <laughs> mom, because I, I did watch you when you were being introduced and the story you did tell us about your mother. Yeah. The economic uh, disadvantage is real, and nobody can doubt that. It's very, very real. I mean, just drive through the streets. How many women are in the streets hawking? compared to others. So I think that even before we go into whether it's good for women or not, we need to see what it is that is doing to our youth, to all of us, boys and girls. Okay, so yes, economic empowerment is very important, but I think also that confidence building is also very, very important. The determination to succeed is very important. So we need to connect many more dots from the economy. It's not just because there are many people who may not even lack so many things, but who are not uh, pushing themselves forward. So there's something else that we see is missing. There are also many people who don't have much. You know the story of uh, the late Esther Unkulenu? Yes. I mean, look at her background and look what she was able to do. Look at the backgrounds of the women in our history. You know, and talking about our history, I'm not only referring to the very, very recent one of the nationalist movement. Although even there, there were many women. Unfortunately, we don't even know who they are. They, they are not in the literature. They are not on our currencies. This cannot be uh, something that encourages many others to come on board. But I'm also talking about the history that has brought us here as a people. The, the history of enslavement. If you study it, you'll see how women fought in this part of the world and elsewhere to stop this kind of atrocity on us. And when you translate it further, women at home, at work, 
on the farms, in the mines, everywhere. You know, so we have many, many, many examples of us. You know, talking about my mother, what did you want to eat? <laughs> I remember you told you told the story at the um, at your outdooring, mm -hmm. but how she pushed you, um, and how for you, your view was that you didn't want to be the last. I mean, you may be the first, but you didn't want to be the last one. Yes, uh, my mother. Yes, uh, beautiful lady, bright, very bright woman who, who didn't have much of a chance, and. Um, you know, like all of us, we want our children to have the things we didn't have, the good things, not everything, but the good things. And so you see, you hear her story, and you know immediately that you have to do it differently. She didn't have a chance. How about you? And what are you doing with a chance that she didn't have? That in itself should be motivation, I think. For, no. uh, for all of us, for generally. Everyone, yes. For everyone. For everyone. As you see a woman with pure water on her head and a baby on her back, and you, d you don't have to do that for a living, and you think you should take that for granted, I don't think you should. You should be very grateful, and you should plan to ensure that if she didn't have a chance, a child on her back may have a better chance. Uh, this Sunday is uh, Mother's Day. Yes. Um, looking forward to it? Absolutely. You know, there's always a, an argument in my home about who should be celebrating the Mother's Day for me. My kids are still young, and so uh, my hubby always tells me, well, wait till they go. <laughs> I'm celebrating my mother. My mother, so <laughs> you should also wait, wait till for your children yes. to celebrate you. But um, <laughs> Mother's Day, it seems to have gained so much attention um, in our part of the world now. Yeah. And I think uh, for reason. Of course, Mother's Day is not complete without Father's Day. It takes two. I mean, now the fathers are fighting for Father's Day, so we, yeah, we, we do but we do remember that's that Father's now. Day. Maybe we'll talk about that <laughs> yes. later on. Uh, yes, it's got momentum. Um, everyone has fond memories of their parents. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the women for good reason. We've already said that they already they are always on the back burner poverty, farm, you know, all those things. So if there's one day for them to feel good, actually, every day should be Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and every day should be Parents' Day. day. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell young fathers that my hope is that as they grow up, Father's Day will be as popular as Mother's, Mother's day. day. And I think it's getting there gradually. And it should get there because... Uh, Sometimes you hear kinds of stories, my dad didn't do this and so on. Now you are a dad, what are you doing? Okay, so what is it? Are you going to whine over what you think went wrong for the rest of your life? Pick some lessons from it and then move forward and do better as you go along. And really, maybe when you get into those shoes, you may yourself realize that, hey, it wasn't as, as easy. So yes, a special day for mothers is never a mistake. It's always a, a sad day for some, though, because course, they are deemed that uh, they, because they don't have children. How can we change our society's attitude? Listen, we don't have to change our society's attitude. We just have to look at our culture. Your mother is not necessarily the one who birthed you, you see? So we have imported all kinds of things, and now we are suffering for it. We don't have to change anything. Traditionally, my sister's children are my children. And my sisters are the mothers of my children, you see? So everyone has a child. It's not necessarily biological. There are people you mother. Mothering is important. Maybe at work, all of us, you know, biologically may have had two, three children. But in the end, you have many, many, many children. And it depends on how you've treated people, how you have extended a hand to somebody, not necessarily because you were in the maternity ward. So it shouldn't create a situation where it is creating sadness in people. No, it's a celebration of womanhood. It's a celebration of caring. It's a celebration of sharing. It's a celebration of, of sacrificing so others will have a better deal. And everybody will, can do that. And I don't think it is necessarily because 
uh, you have been the one to birth the child. Although I'm not, although that is also important. I'm not saying I'm not down uh, playing that, but I'm, but I'm just responding to the sadness. It should increase sadness. Many many people who biologically didn't have children have done much much better, much much better than some of us who biologically had children. Look at all the street children. I'm sure somebody birthed them. How come they're in the streets? Where are the mothers? You see? That, is that, and if is somebody that worry reaches some, out... Does that worry you, the, of the extent it, of um, streetism we have? Of course, it, it should worry all of us. It should worry all of us. And whether they abandon children, whether they run away from home, whatever the reasons are, it should bother us. Because nobody is a child forever. They're going to grow up. And without the care that they need, at the time they need the care most, what kind of adults will they grow up to be? So it should be a matter that bothers everybody. Sometimes it's a contradiction in terms for me. Because yes, we praise our women, we carry, uh, raise them on a pedestal. But at the same time, we have high levels of uh, domestic violence, we have uh, spousal deaths, and we have uh, lots of indignities that women suffer. Can we emerge from this ever? You know, to a time where we will not talk about domestic violence, a time where we will never talk about, you know, indignities that women have to endure. I wish to. Violence, of course, is not something anybody should uh, support for any reason. But there are times to where, beyond the condemnation, and I'm not trying to justify, but we need to look at something like mental health. I'm not saying everybody who does that has a challenge, but I think it's something where the... There must be more investigation into why some of these things happen. Yes, we must, because I don't think the person woke up one day and became violent. Where were the signs? What should we have known? What should the family have known? What should the woman have seen in order even to support him? to become less violent, or to get the, the help he needs to ensure that. So when you are unhappy with somebody, uh, you don't just go hitting that person, and that is not a solution to any problem. So counseling is important. You see, the society has evolved so fast. Uh, the support system we had is, is, you know, is fast evaporating, you know, so that um, people just take you know, they are the law unto themselves. This is not helpful. So I would say that bringing the subject up is very important. Talking about this is very important. All of us getting the necessary public education. It's not only when you are getting married, even at work, or even when somebody's child is living with you. You know, it, when, whenever people are in any position of authority, to learn not to abuse that authority. It may not, violence can also be, be verbal. It can be attitudinal. It can be many things. And of course, it can also be physical. So let us bring the subject up. Let us all watch our own backs. Let us all measure our emotional levels. If you feel you are too angry, maybe you should keep quiet. <laughs> you know, if you feel you are too upset, maybe you should just walk away rather than take it out because in the end, the situation gets much worse. So we all need support. We need to support each other. And because the condemnation is not getting as far. Yeah. Um, as we mark Mother's Day, what's your message? Um, and you can do it in, in tears. Message to women, message to young ladies, message to men. I'll say that. And even the children too. Yes, I want to start with the children. The children know us better than we'll ever know ourselves. They may, not be, they may not have all the words to say so, but they know us. So I'm connecting the children to the mothers and to the fathers too. Every man has a, has a mother, so does every woman. So I want to begin there. And in so doing, I want to weave everybody in between the child and the mother. We have different types of mothers. My mother will be a grandmother to somebody, and so on and so forth. So there's also a chain of mothers. And 
And to realize that, yes, it's Mother's Day, but it doesn't mean that anybody owes us anything. It's all a reflection of how we have related with them. So as we celebrate Mother's Day, it also should be a day of stock taking. I want to salute every mother, and I want to salute mothers who have put their children first. Okay? I want to salute mothers who have made the necessary arrangements to ensure that not only their children, all the children in their care have also had a chance or a better chance than they have had. So I want to salute and recognize all the difficult dis uh, decisions, the sacrifices, the efforts, the sleepless nights and so on. Um, they are all part of our job. And I also want to say that, yes, there's no perfect mother because we are all human beings. We are not perfect people, but we can all try. We can all try to be better people. We were, we can all try to be better today than we were yesterday. Okay. Congratulations to all mothers. We can never thank you enough. Uh, and who can thank anyone for bringing the person into the world? for caring for them during difficult times. They won't eat, they won't sleep, they won't understand, they disagree with you. <laughs> and, and not even because they have the words to disagree with you, but because they don't have the words to disagree with you. And therefore they are throwing tantrums all over the place, the patients, you know. And I also urge that we all learn from each other. You know, some mothers may have stories to share, they may have experiences to share. One question I used to ask my students at the end of every course was that, so assuming you were to take this course again, what would be your expectation? And it helped me a lot. It really, really helped me a lot. A lot of mothers would be expecting gifts. If you don't get a gift. I don't think it should be about merchandising, okay? If your child can afford a gift, but you see, as I said, every day is Mother's Day. If you want to afford a gift, afford it every day. Maybe that's not even what your mother needs. Has she told you she wants a gift? Or oh, do you call her often, once a week? Does she hear from you once a week? Do you, do you bother whether she's well or not? Maybe that's what the mother needs. I don't think we are demanding the moon from our children. We appreciate the gifts they give us, but I don't think is a primary reason to make us happy because our child has bought us a gift. It's about reflecting on it's, what they it's need. It's about the, ty the kind of relationship you maintain with your mother when it's not Mother's Day. So don't come smiling one day and then the following day what happens? You are calling her a witch. I I is that it? Your mother who birthed you, who did all of that, all of a sudden has become a witch because somebody told you she's a witch. And that person is not your mother's child. But that person has been able to convince you she's a witch. Look how we treat the old women. Stoning them to death. What should we tell the women at in the so-called witches camps? All of a sudden, you've forgotten them. Then what are you doing? So that day you buy a cloth and take it to her at the witches camp and leave her there. We need to get serious and know that all this packaging and fanfare is not life. This has been First Take on 3FM and TV3. We've been speaking to the NDC's vice presidential running mate for the 2020 elections, Professor Nana Jane Opukajiman. My name is Jifa Bampo. Thank you for joining us.